please welcome Dr. Robert Lustig. Thanks, Dominic. Thank you so much, Dave. And uh, thank you all for being here. Thank Mark Benioff for providing this wonderful venue for all of you. And uh, thank my colleagues and uh, co-speakers today uh, as well. Uh, before I get started, I want to mention that I have no disclosures. Is this, the, whoop, there we go, there we go, no disclosures. Um, all right, before I get started, I want you all to look to the left of you, look to the right of you. One of the three of you is obese. Truly. Because here's the data. Take a look. Number four for both men and women, computer IT, 33% obese. Okay? I didn't make it up. Okay? This is San Francisco, so it's a little bit thinner than the rest of the country, but you know, I'm telling you, this is, this is, here's the data. Okay? I didn't. Uh, anyway. Are we indeed fat for life? Our children are now uh, tipping the scales like you can't believe. We're doing bariatric surgery on children. Children are getting type 2 diabetes. The important thing is not so much that we're obese, but that of those 33% of you out there that uh, that slide referred to, 80% of you will die of complications of your obesity. That is type 2 diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and also cancer and Alzheimer's disease. These are all chronic metabolic diseases that come not just from inactivity, but from a very specific thing in our environment that we actually put there and that we're going to have to fix. And that's what this talk is about. Now, obesity has been around for as long as there have been people. This is a statue, an 11 inch statue, in a Vienna museum called the Venus von Willendorf. It is dated back to 22,000 BC. It was unearthed in 1908. And what it shows is that the ancients knew about obesity before they knew about Burger King. But something in the last 30 years has clearly happened. Because instead of 5% of people being above the 95th percentile of BMI, now 30% of people are above the 95th percentile. So what has happened? How did we get here? And how did we get here so fast? That's what today is about. To understand obesity, we have to understand the first law of thermodynamics. Now, not all of you took physics, so I will state it for you very clearly. The total energy inside a closed system remains constant. I believe in the first law. I am a great proponent of the first law. But there are two interpretations of that first law. The interpretation that you've been taught, both in school and by the media and by our government, is the following. If you eat it, you better burn it or you're going to store it. If that's the case, then obesity is the result of two aberrant behaviors, gluttony and sloth. So when you see somebody who's obese, hey, you're a glutton and a sloth. Indeed, Tommy Thompson, our Secretary of Health and Human Services back in 2004, said it on the Today Show. Hey, we're just gluttons and sloths. We just eat too damn much and we don't, we're not active. And that's what your doctors tell you too. You go to the doctor, you say, why am I obese? Oh, you eat less, exercise more. Well, guess what? Eat less, exercise more doesn't work. If it worked, we wouldn't have this problem. Indeed, Mark Lara just talked about the future of health care. I'm here to tell you that we wouldn't need health care reform if we had obesity reform. Because it's chewing through $200 billion in health care dollars every single year. If we recaptured that $200 billion, we would not need any obesity reform, and we wouldn't have to worry about rationing. So we got to open our minds. we got to get past this idea. The dogma. A calorie is a calorie. If you eat more than you burn, you're going to gain weight. If you burn more than you eat, you're going to lose weight. Garbage. From that dogma, though, comes the concept of, well, it's free will. It's your choice. Personal responsibility. You did it to yourself. It's your fault. Therefore, we're not going to pay for it. Gluttony and sloth, diet and exercise, all comes from this notion that a calorie is a calorie. I'm here to tell you that that is not true. A calorie is not a calorie. And there are lots of reasons to know that a calorie is not a calorie, and I will prove it to you. If a calorie is a calorie, then we've just got a caloric back in it. Wait, this slide's not right. That's better. Okay? 
187 calories a day extra in men, 335 calories extra a day going into women, 275 in teens over the last 25 years. So you say, well, there's our obesity right there. The evolution of fast food, is this really what happened? Over here on the left, we have the original White Castle hamburger, one ounce, okay? And in the midst of the obesity epidemic, we have the Hardy's Thick Burger over there on the right, 1,420 calories. And here in California, we even have Carl's Jr., the $6 burger, 2,300 calories. That's more than your caloric allotment per day in one meal. So you say, well, that's it. Well, how about this? I love this. Free chicken sandwich with the purchase of a 30-ounce drink. Has food gotten so cheap that we actually now give it away? All right. But there it is. Yeah. Or is it an activity famine? This is a, uh, on the y-axis, we have physical activity in girls. On the x-axis, age, 9 going up to 19. The top line is Caucasians. The bottom line is African Americans. And you can see by age 15, the African American girls don't even move. They're just lying prostrate on the floor. Well, so you'd say, well, there we go, right? Diet and exercise, gluttony and sloth, food and activity, that's what it's all about, garbage. Because education consists mainly of what we have unlearned. And I'm going to unlearn you right now. So is it behavior? Is it personal responsibility? Well, there are six reasons to doubt this formulation. First, no child chooses to be obese. The quality of life of an obese child is the same as a child on cancer chemotherapy. Do you think anybody chooses this? I weigh too much. You think I choose to be? I know everything that there is to know about this, and I can't get my weight down. Okay? Number two, does diet work? Well, here's the data. Yeah, it works for about six months, and then look what happens. It all comes back. And if you look on the right, the maintenance of weight loss, no one can do it. No one can do it. In fact, we know that. That's why we have the, this obesity epidemic. How about exercise? The vertical line is the identity line, and here are a bunch of meta-analyses plotted against uh, each other to show that when compared with no treatment, exercise resulted in a one kilo weight loss. Well, if burning energy makes you lose weight, then exercise should work, but it doesn't. So you say, well, that's because they're non-compliant. Garbage, they're not. That's not what it's about. And number three, it's not just about America. It's so not just about the UK, not just about Australia. It's on the rise in every single developed and also developing country. I just came back from Malaysia where I got this cold, okay? And they've got the highest incidence of obesity and diabetes in the world, Malaysia, okay? Number four, the poor are disproportionately affected. Well, you know, they don't have choices. They don't even have supermarkets. They don't have the choice of being able to say, I'm gonna eat healthy. They can't let their kid out of the house for fear of crime. If you don't have a choice, is it really personal responsibility? Think about it. Number five, the prevalence of obesity is going up faster in kids, especially toddlers, two to five-year-olds, than it is even in adults, as you can see in the green line here. And finally, number six, my favorite, we even have an epidemic of obese six-month-olds. They don't diet and exercise. How are you going to explain that? So any hypothesis you want to proffer to me about explaining the obesity epidemic has to be able to explain this as well. You can't. In fact, it's because a calorie is a calorie is wrong. And I'm going to show you how right now. All right. You want to talk about calories? I really don't, but let's talk. 275 calories a day extra in teen boys. What are they? What are they consuming? Is it fat? No, not really. Five grams, 45 calories in teen boys. It's not the fat, people. Okay? In fact, as our percent calories from fat has gone from 40% to 30% because of the mandate from the AHA, the AMA, and the USDA back in 1982, we have actually accomplished that from 40 to 30%. And look at our obesity prevalence has just gone through the roof. And it's not because we've increased our fat intake. What have we increased? Our carbohydrate. 57 grams, 228 calories in teen boys, and specifically beverage intake. 
41% increase in soft drinks, 35% increase in fruit drinks, fruit aids, et cetera. For those of you who like the thermodynamic law, one can of soda a day is 150 calories times 365 days a year, divide by the magic number of 3,500 calories in a pound. Yes, if you eat or drink 3,500 calories more than you burn, you will gain one pound of fat. That is true. 15 and a half pounds of fat per year, and our kids aren't drinking one soft drink, they're drinking four. Okay? Come to my clinic and see for yourself. All right, so what's in soft drinks? In fact, what's in all our foods? Well, in America, a lot of this stuff is what we call high fructose corn syrup, the most demonized additive known to man. If you look on the left, you'll see a molecule of glucose, a six-membered ring, and a molecule of fructose, a five-membered ring. High fructose corn syrup from the Corn Refiners Association is either 42 or 55 percent fructose. It's the fructose part that we're talking about, because that's the sweet part. Glucose is not sweet. Glucose is what's in starch. Starch is not sweet. Fructose is sweet. That's what makes you want more, the sweet. Sucrose, table sugar, plain old cane beet sugar, the stuff you put in your coffee, that's the stuff on the bottom. Okay, same thing. Six-membered ring, five-membered ring, just bound together through an ether linkage. There's an enzyme in your intestine that cleaves that in about a nanosecond. Basically, it's a wash. High fructose corn syrup sugar, no difference. Everybody wants to make this about high fructose corn syrup. It's not. It's about all the sugar because they're the same. High corn Refining Association tries to actually make, you know, something of that. The new, you know, uh, uh, their new campaign, you know, corn sugar, you know, because it's natural. It is natural. I'm not even arguing that. Point is, they're equally bad. Equally bad, equally poisonous, I said it, and you'll see why. So here's the secular trend in fructose consumption, that five-membered ring, the sweet part, the problem part. The natural consumption of fructose from fruits and vegetables, like our ancestors did, say, 100 years ago, 15 grams a day when you ate what came out of the ground. And our livers can handle that. Prior to World War II, with the advent of the candy industry and the start of the sugar industry in this country, we got up to about six, 20 grams of fructose per day. By 1977, just before the advent of high fructose corn syrup into our diet, we got to about 37 grams a day, which is 8% of our total caloric intake. By 1994, we were up to 55 grams a day, or 10% of our total caloric intake. And now, adolescents are up to 75 and even 90 and 100 grams of fructose per day, 15% of our total caloric intake per day. So double that for total sugar, because that's, remember, because it's two molecules. So that's 30% of your total diet calories are coming from sugar alone. And the question is, what does that do to you? That's what this is about. So not only are we consuming more calories, but we're consuming more of those calories as fructose. And ultimately, this takes a toll. This ultimately makes something happen. So back in the 1980s, we said dietary fat was bad. The percent fat went down. Well, you know what? When you take the fat out of the food, what does it taste like? It tastes like cardboard. Food industry knows that. They have to substitute it with something. So what they substitute it with? Sugar, right, exactly. So, snack wells. Everybody know snack wells? Two grams of fat out, 13 grams of carbohydrate in, four of which were sugars. Okay? Do anything for our waistline? Only made it go up. Okay? The point is that fructose is not glucose. The common wisdom out there is that sugar is just empty calories. And you can get your empty calories from any food you want. Right? You can eat extra of this, that, the other thing. The point is that sugar is not empty calories. Sugar is toxic beyond its caloric equivalent. If you ate the same amount of sugar versus the same amount of protein in terms of calories, the sugar would be way worse, way worse. Because the liver metabolizes fructose differently than it does glucose, and chronic fructose exposure alone promotes all of those chronic metabolic diseases I told you about before, called the metabolic syndrome. And lastly, fructose tricks the brain into making you want more. And the food industry knows that. And that's why they put fructose into everything. Everything. Things that never had fructose before. Ketchup, barbecue sauce, pretzels, hamburger buns, you name it. 31 out of 32 uh, uh, commercially available breads at Safeway today have high fructose corn syrup in them. Do you know why? Number one, it browns better. Well, that's browning your arteries as we speak. Number two, shelf life. 
Everybody remember bread boxes? Anybody ever see a bread box anymore? Where'd they go? How come? Because the bread doesn't stale. How come the bread doesn't stale? Does anybody ever think about it? It's because the sugar that they put in the bread actually takes the place of water. And when the water, because if the water dries out, then the bread stales. But when the sugar displaces the water, it's called water activity, the bread doesn't stale. No bread boxes. Shelf life. Lower depreciation. Profit. Got it? Okay. So I'm going to show you now why glucose and fructose are different. And I'm going to do it very simply because you didn't have science. Okay? But let's consume 120 calories in glucose. Two slices of white bread, not the stuff at the store, but the stuff, you know, your mother makes. Okay? Or a quarter cup of rice, anything. Okay? 80% of that 120 calories will be metabolized by all the organs in the body over here on the right. Because every organ in the body can metabolize glucose. 20, excuse me, 20% 20 or 24 calories will hit the liver. Let's follow those 24 calories. Okay, and I'm not going to make a big deal of this. All I want you to do is see that big white arrow. It's pointing at a compound called glycogen. Glycogen is the liver storage form of glucose. And glycogen is non-toxic. The overwhelming majority of the glucose you consume ends up as glycogen, and your liver can handle it because glycogen is non-toxic. Your liver can store any amount of glycogen it needs, and I can prove it to you, marathoning carb loaders. Okay? They're making glycogen hand over fist. Doesn't hurt their liver any, okay? because glucose is okay. Now let's talk about something that's not okay. Let's talk about a different carbohydrate, my favorite carbohydrate, maybe yours too. Okay, it's a carbohydrate, ethanol, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, but we know that ethanol is also a toxin. It's two toxins in one. You wrap your Lamborghini around a tree, you fry your liver, right? Acute and chronic ethanol exposure, okay? We're only going to talk about the chronic today. Let's show you what happens with ethanol. So let's consume 120 calories in, of ethanol. Shot of maker's mark, okay? So before, two slices of white bread, now it's a shot of maker's mark, same number of calories, isocaloric, but not isometabolic, you'll see. So what happens? 24 of those calories get m taken right off the table because the stomach, intestine, metabolize some by the f something called the first pass effect, and the kidney, muscle, and brain can use another 10%. So there goes 24 calories off the, off the top, top. 96 calories hitting the liver. How many with glucose? 24. How many with ethanol? 96. Four times the substrate, and that's the problem. This is a dose phenomenon. How many calories the liver gets is what this is all about. Okay? So let's follow that. 96 calories. Here's the ethanol. Going into the liver, you see glycogen anywhere? What do you see? You see it all going down to this little box down at the bottom. That's called your mitochondria. And your mitochondria is the furnace of your cell that burns the energy. And when you overload your mitochondria, you get what, you, what I call mitochondrial meltdown. You get reactive oxygen species, you get toxins that form that ultimately kill the cell. So any food stuff that gets the uh, compound to your mitochondria without diverting it to glycogen first causes trouble. And ethanol does that. And that's why ethanol fries your liver. Everybody get the picture? See what the problem is? And insulin's the way you make glycogen. You see insulin anywhere on this? It's not happening because ethanol doesn't need insulin. So when your mitochondria get overloaded, you get a problem. We got 96 calories hitting your mitochondria. How many did we have before? Almost none. Now, to the main event, fructose. Let's consume 120 calories in sucrose. Glass of orange juice, eight ounces of orange juice. So. We have, two, uh, we have two slices of white bread, shot of maker's mark, glass of orange juice. Isochloric, but not isometabolic. What happens to that? So 40, uh, the glucose of the fructose does the same 20-80 split it did before. So 12 calories hitting the liver, plus the whole 60 of fructose, because only the liver can metabolize fructose. Well, here's what happens. That's a lot of arrows, isn't it? Okay, do you see glycogen anywhere on there? Not at all. You see a lot of stuff going to the mitochondria, though, and it's causing a lot of problems. It's causing hypertension, hyperinsulinemia, hepatic insulin resistance, dyslipidemia, muscle insulin resistance, obesity, and also fructose has an effect on the brain to cause continued consumption, which I will show you right now. 
So what's the difference? We got 150 calories in a can of Coke, 150 calories, that's a can of beer, if we go back one. Okay, that was supposed to be a can of, there we go, a can of beer, okay? 3.6% alcohol, 90 calories of alcohol, 60 of maltose, that's glucose. Okay, when you do the first pass effect, when you do the calories hitting the liver, notice, they're the same. So we have this phenomenon in America called beer belly, well, welcome to soda belly, because that's what we suffer from. That's America, that's our kids. They're getting the same diseases for the same reasons through the same mechanisms because fructose and ethanol are indistinguishable at the level of the liver. And it makes sense that that would even be the case because after all, where do you get ethanol from? Fermentation of fructose, it's called wine. We do it up in Napa. So the big difference between the two is that for ethanol, the yeast does the first step in metabolism. And for fructose, we do our own first step. But once it gets to the mitochondria, it's all the same and it's causing disease in addition. Junk food addiction may be a clue to obesity. How about that? You've heard this before, junk food addict, right? I'm going to prove to you, from, well, not prove, I'm going to suggest to you that this is actually indeed the case, okay? Because the criteria for a substance to be addictive are the following, binging, withdrawal, craving, and cross-sensitization with other drugs of abuse. That is, if you get expose uh, a, an animal or a patient to one drug for a while and then take that one away and then expose them to a second drug of abuse, they actually get a heightened re physiologic response. That's cross-sensitization. Fructose does all of those. And I'm gonna show you one of them right now. Anybody see this movie? Yes, Supersize Me? I'm gonna play you one 20 second clip from Supersize Me. You watch. I was feeling bad in the car. Feeling like shit, really. I was feeling really, really, sick and unhappy, started eating, feel great, feel really good now. I feel so good, it's crazy. Isn't that right, baby? Yeah, you're crazy, all right. Okay. That was on day 18 of his little ordeal. This is a guy who ate vegan because his, wife, his girlfriend was a vegan chef. In 18 days, he just described drug withdrawal. Everybody got it? You can do it to anybody in 18 days. Indeed, that's what the, the animal studies show too. Three weeks and you're addicted. He's addicted at 18 days. It wasn't the high fat diet he was on, it was the high sugar diet. It was those supersized drinks. So what I'm gonna propose to you is that we think about that first law completely differently. Here's how I think we should state it. If you're gonna store it, that is an obligate weight gain set up by biochemical forces out of your control, and you expect to burn it, that is normal energy expenditure for normal quality of life. Because energy expenditure and quality of life are the same thing. How many calories you burn and how good you feel are the same thing. Things that make your energy expenditure go up make you feel good, like exercise, caffeine, ephedrine, it's off the market. Things that m reduce your energy expenditure make you feel lousy, like hypothyroidism, starvation. So if you're gonna store it and you expect to burn it, then you're gonna have to eat it. Same first law but turned on its head. And indeed, if you do that, now the two aberrant behaviors of gluttony and sloth are really a result of our biochemistry, and our biochemistry is a result of our environment. And we have changed our environment and has impacted on our biochemistry in big ways. So why is exercise important in obesity? Because it burns calories? Come on. 20 minutes of jogging is one chocolate chip cookie. No one can do it. You all know that. Why does it work? because it improves your insulin and how it works in your muscles. Because it reduces stress, which you're gonna hear about from Dr. Chesney, with the result in cortisol release, which is a stress hormone, which does damage. And because it makes your liver run faster, burning up all those metabolites in your mitochondria before it has a chance to do damage, that's why. Why is fiber important in obesity? Okay, high fiber lunch on purpose, okay? When God made the poison, he packaged it with the antidote. Okay? The fiber is the good part of the fruit. The juice is the bad part of the fruit. The juice is nature's way of getting you to eat your fiber. So when you go to Jamba Juice, you're getting garbage. Got it? The whole fruit, the fiber containing fruit. When you put it in the juicer, the fiber gets sheared, it's now gone. Fruit, not fruit juice. Here's what fiber does. Reduces how fast the sugar gets absorbed, giving your liver a chance to catch up so the insulin stays down increases the speed of transit through your intestine so you can get the satiety signal sooner, so you don't get the second portion. You don't need it. And finally, it inhibits the absorption of some of the fats from the small intestine get into the large intestine where the bacteria there 
turn them into short-chain fatty acids. Those get absorbed and keep your insulin low, which is a good thing. So in my world, there's two op options. There's fat and fart. <laughs> All right. The American Heart Association has now taken a 180-degree turn away from low fat and has actually now embraced the fact that sugar is a problem. This is a scientific statement from the American Heart Association that came out last year. I'm proud to be a co-author on it. Now, whether you know it or not, you are in a war. An, un, an unseen, hidden war. It's the food industry against you. Because whatever's good for you is bad for them, and whatever's good for them is bad for you. There is no middle ground, and they're winning because you don't even know you're fighting. Take a look at the S&P 500, and look at the economic downturn that occurred in 2008, and look at Coke, Pepsi, and McDonald's. They're doing better than you are. Promise. And when we look here at the stock prices of the other various food companies compared to the S&P, the S&P is now in red on the bottom, okay? There's ConAgra, Archer Daniels Midland, Procter & Gamble, General Mills, Monsanto, Hormel & Kraft. They're all doing better than you. Promise. Because they have figured out a way to hijack your taste buds and your brain to eat more. And it's called sugar. And it's killing you. So with, for further reading, I've listed some papers here, okay, all in relation to how sugar affects your body and your brain to cause this epidemic. With that, I want to take any questions you have, and thank you for your attention.